what I want to talk about today comes back through my interest with landlines. Yeah. In, in looking at landlines, I looked at the history of landlines. So this is about switchboards, telephone exchanges and underground Manchester. The switch telephone network will be switched off in 2025. That's what's going to happen with landlines. They're all going to go by 2025 and they're stepping up. There are three companies, BT, Virgin and Sky that predominate. Half, half of those are for BT. <clears throat> and they're going to an internet-based connection. Anyway, before this, there were telephone exchanges. And <clears throat> last night I was at a, a dinner party in Chalton, like we are, eating our quinoa butties. And um, I asked people, where is the Chalton telephone exchange? And as most of them lived in Chalton, none of them could actually point to it. These are buildings that we go past very frequently and think mm, that's a bit of a mess and then move on and this one here in the background is Cholton's uh it's in Manchester Road is it Manchester Road nope yeah. it's on Albany yeah. Road uh, I think well, it is yeah and it, just it's, ju it's just next to the unicorn right oh right there are 44 telephone exchanges in the 0161 area plus five that have just recently been closed this is the um, the dial house in Salford. Well, it's in so only just in Salford. It's um, on the, the Salford Manchester border. And it's uh, between Victoria Bridge and Blackfriars Bridge. It faces the Renaissance Hotel on the riverside and stands on Chapel Street land side, on the land side. There are 10 stories and at least eight on the Chapel Street side. And bizarrely, as you can see on the left, there is a, a portico, more like an elevated Roman temple on the top. And um, it was the one of the major bases, both for the telephone exchange and also for the security of the telephone system, telecommunications altogether, which led to the secret Manchester. There is a tunnel underneath it. Now these are switchboard operators they were known rather uh, paternalistically as the hello girls originally in that the the job was to apparently took concentration interpersonal skills and quick hands and therefore the messenger boys that originally manned these manned is that word operated these switchboards became all female areas and what would happen a telephone user would pick up the phone connect immediately to the switchboard where they were first would ask number please and, and then they would then add hold the line please as they removed and inserted jack plugs to connect the call these surprisingly were still going till 1960 some of them because it took a long time to switch over from the old manual ones Though the first um, automated telephone exchange, the ATEs, they seem to love acronyms this lot, um, was opened in Surrey in May 1912. But the problem was they were very expensive to install. And whilst they made savings eventually be cut by making operators redundant, it took time for this to generate cash. The two world wars also slowed it down a bit. One of the last ones was this one in Enfield, North London, which switched to the automatic connection at 1.30 on the 5th of October, 1960. Now, there's something else I remember from this time, personally, which were party lines. Does everybody, anybody else remember party lines? Yeah. Did, have you, did your parents have one? Yeah. yeah, I agree, yeah. Didn't have a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we, <were poor. laughs> we we had a party line, but it was only I think there was one other one. But they went up to 10, 10 people on a um, uh, a party line. There's this one American advert saying saying said a party line is like a barn raising, which is an American tradition of everybody helping to make a barn, which is illustrated at the back. Um, Telephone neighbours can make their party line an ideal example of cooperation by using their telephone sharingly. 
The endless demand for low-cost rural telephone service, but, uh, this expanded service increases the usefulness of every telephone. You could make use of most of it and help yourself to better service by being a good party line member. And these are the sort of adverts that were going on as they tried to move on from party lines. Uh, maybe it's a date for Sister Sue or a business call for Dad. Again, <laughs> it's all very paternal. It's, uh, he's sitting down writing the newspaper. His wife's coming from the um, from the kitchen with a, a pinny on. And uh, grandmother and grandma are calling mother to find out things are okay. And then uh, a little one about te teenagers as well, which I like. But the... There was also a side to it where, which led to problems because people could overhear. There could be a lot of eavesdropping going on because the phone would ring. You pick it up, you realize it was somebody else, and you could stay on listening to what they said. So nothing, nothing could be kept secret. And in fact, also, if you had an emergency, it depended on the other people ending their call. In an America, somebody was taken to court and given a suspended sentence when somebody who was a, a volunteer fire, fireman wasn't allowed to get on the phone to to um, say that there was a house and a, a shed on fire next door. Anyway, in, a, in also in Jackson, Mississippi, the people there demanded that party lines be segregated, that the party lines that they were on would be all white. <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> which, which is stunning, really. Though, oddly, <laughs> given Mississippi's reputation, they were refused this, maybe because it was too awkward to actually organise anyway. The, the party lines, I remember they, they did disappear eventually, but they lasted until about the year 2000 in some places. The last ones were taken out. Again, it's another little sideline that, you, you know, you think, I vaguely remember those, but hardly ever. And also, um, telephones then... We were linked to an exchange by their number. So the the, the does anybody remember the num the sorry the letters the first three letters? Does anybody remember their first three letters? Mine was Chalton, C H O, which Mine became eight eight one. S A L, which became nice. Salford. Salford. Was sale. Sale. Oh right, and there was I also L Stratford was L O N yeah. Longford. D R O. Which was Dralston, but we well, didn't actually live in Dralston. This is the Moss Side telephone. I was interested. I became interested in the exchanges. I went around looking for them, and that's um, the Google view of them from above, of the Moss Side telephone exchange, in nineteen, uh, which was built in nineteen twenty-five. Still there. That's the photo of it. I took from Google Earth, Google uh, Maps. I don't know. Again, it's in the middle of the estate. Don't know whether you've ever noticed it. Anybody who lives nearby there. But eventually, they were replaced by the digital system or the um, electromechanical devices developed by ones that are using digital methodologies. And the all, first all digital telephone exchange in was opened in West London in 1968. The last manual exchange was converted in 1975. So this leads me on to the under the what was called the Guardian Underground Telephone Exchange, the GOOT. Um, this was made in the 1950s during the Cold War. And it, later on in the 1980s, when I, I was doing some research with British Telecom and was invited to an open day at the underground bunker which was uh, quite fascinating. So it was nuclear hardened facility designed to solve, uh, safeguard Cold War communications. So there's an entrance just it off um, George Street in off Oxford Street in Manchester. And there's also one at that, um, the Irwell telephone exchange. There was an entrance to it there as well. And they were, they were all connected by tunnels. So Scheme 567, as it was uh, noted, was one of three such exchanges, the others being in Birmingham and London. It's only one of three. What what does nuclear nuclear hardened mean? It means they've got, well, you'll come on to it, you'll see it as we go, we go, that, go down one. So this is where we, we entered. Now, this is interesting. I don't know whether this will work. I'm going to give it a try. Right. This is Google Streets Live. Okay, is, that, is everybody familiar with Google 
Google Maps and the way that can be used. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you can tour around Manchester on it very easily. But the, can you see this, by the way? See the yeah. Okay. yeah. So there, there's yeah. the. You remember when um, Graham did his talk about Oxford Street and Oxford Road? We went down here. Well, yeah. this is George yeah. Street here. Let's go down go George Street. So there it is. It's still there. I don't know. If they're all, all these things are still there. It's just that they're, they're so kind of raggedy buildings. It's amazing, I think, the way we just don't notice stuff. As it, Can you see also in the front of um, George Street is one of those green boxes? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that... Those are just the local version. I'm sure you've seen um, British Telecom uh, en engineers sitting on a little yeah. stool in front of those, and they've opened them, and it just looks like a mass of connections, doesn't it? Yeah. How, how the yeah. heck they navigate that, I don't know. But they, they, they're, they're at the local level. They're the local equivalent. It goes from the various places that, that house the telephone exchanges through to these green boxes, these green boxes are then linked by the telegraph poles and whatever the telephone wires underground to your house. Well, when I was researching this, I, I came back through Chalton and I spotted just on the left and right of me about six or seven of these. And normally I just never notice them. I mm -hmm. presume it's the same for you. We just accept these things are there and we don't really yeah. know what they are. So I thought that was interesting that 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 was happening to me. Is is the we were we were shepherding into there, and this this building in the middle, this one here, um, there are doors down into that. They they were open. Those are ordinary drawers, and and then we went through some extraordinary, um, you know, like the bank vault doors. They were like that. Those kind of doors, they had blast doors. Right. Okay. They're, 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 as I say, like bank vaults, and then you go through two of them, and then we came, went to a lift and went down the lift. Underneath, you could hear the water course that you went under and down. It was, you know, it was 100 feet, it's 120, 40 feet down. So that's that's another view of the, the George Street rear. This is um, an artesian well at lower level with a borehole 800 feet deep. It also needed to get rid of the uh, the water, which it did via the um, the one on the banks of the Irwell. And if you look there, there's a pipe coming out of it with water just spouting out into the Irwell, which they're 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 getting rid of from the underground bunkers. It's a one and a half mile cable tunnel that runs from the, the place we've just seen near Oxford Street. We went down it, and there were some sleeping quarters there, and they put on 1940s dance music to make us feel in the part. And then we went in through the tunnels. You see the tunnels? <laughs> there you go. They even had a little piano in there. And I think that's a, uh, one of those little football table football games, isn't it, in the left? Yeah. 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 But we walked down here, and they put um, red, yellow, and white, no, black, red, yellow, and white, lights right through there which were the british telecom lights we walked down it and came out in rutherford house in piccadilly which is still there it looks like that now it's called the exchange the apparently the there were ardick ardwick and sulford shafts as well into this it's the tunnel, tunnels wide wide enough to drive a small vehicle through the staff, in fact, used a vehicle known as the tractor to drag thick copper cables through it before the age of fiber optics. They also used bicycles to navigate the cable tunnels as it um, went for quite some distance. The cable tunnel intersects the larger tunnels, which house the exchange equipment. These are two Crossley diesel generators. Do you know where Crossley's engineering used to be? No. Gorton fantastic place fantastic engineering expertise in that whole area which of course all disappeared but these were two diesel generators uh the first one at the front there is called jane and the second one called marilyn this is also to, you know to give ventilation and everything why were they called jane and marilyn do you think 
Jane Mansfield and Marilyn Monroe probably. Yeah, after after busty women. <laughs> yeah. As you can see, the world of BT engineers was a fairly fairly male occupation at the time. Yeah, I think we can rightly do that. So it's it, the actual tunnels are 112 feet below. And um, the two entrances were these anonymous doorways in Chinatown at the back of the Piccadilly Hotel, which I've pointed out to you. But we, we came up into there and had a very nice slap up meal as well, which was very nice. But I, I was absolutely astonished by it. I didn't know anything about it at the time. And it, it was, was called the whole, the whole system was called The Guardian, which is interesting, given the Manchester Guardian was based around there as well. Um, there were, you know, there's still a, occasional fault repairs to it it's by and large it's um it, it was only fully operational to about the 1990s and they all had to sign the official secret official secrets act it's still there is one 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 per, a spokeswoman said it's still there now under north york street with tunnels connecting to ardock and Sulf sulfur but it's defunct these days so i don't think they've decided what to do i think they could make a tourist attraction out of it really Mm. And the, they weren't the only secret bunkers. This is in Nantwich, in Cheshire. It's the Hack Green, Hack Green Secret Nuclear Bunker. During the war, it was um, uh, an operation to to try and fool German radar, which was being developed then, to to try and make them avoid Liverpool and Manchester. I think that was its kind of secret role then. Then it became taken over by the Home Office and became part of the regional um, seats of government. Do anybody remember RSGs, regional seats of government? You've heard about them? Well, th yeah. this is actually a, a regional government headquarters is one of three of them, I think. There's one in, no, no, for the Northwest, there were two. There was this one in Hart Green and one in Southport. And these, again, were, the, there are 17 throughout the UK designed to enable the government to continue in the aftermath of a major nuclear attack on the UK. About 1992, following the uh, the end of the Cold War, if that has ended, the Home Office abandoned the network of RGHQs and sold many of the sites. The Hack Green Bunker was published by a private company, and now it's open to the public. You can go for tours of that. I don't think it's half as interesting as the Manchester one. And this was at uh, Cheadle Hospital, just at the back of Alexandra Hospital in Cheadle. It was only it was demolished, I think, about um, uh, 10, 20 years ago. But it was a Cheadle uh, nuclear bunker for Manchester. Not a major one. It was two stories with three foot wall, thick walls and was equipped especially for use by the police, army, fire and other emergency services in the event of a nuclear attack. It had its own telecom system. Slowly, these were abandoned. And that's it. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Very interesting. So, yeah, I remember going back about 20 more years. They had these blue badge guides. Um, and you, I used to just sort of go and book on them um, from like um, a guide right around the Midland Hotel to and the very first one I did was living and dying during the cholera epidemic. And my friend said, you do know how to enjoy yourself, don't you? <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was amazing. You know, it didn't cost much. And you put your name down and a group of about 10 or 15 of you would just wander to the place you were going in Manchester. It was fascinating. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.